Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Krug, the Executive Director of Call for Justice, a small nonprofit based in Minneapolis that works to connect low-income people with civil legal resources in the Twin Cities and, to a certain extent, greater Minnesota. Um, we're here today for what will be our 18th training session with United Way 211. We have a phenomenal speaker uh, to talk about government benefits, whom I'll introduce here in a second. United um, Call for Justice uh, generally works to, as I said, connect low-income people with civil legal resources. We do that in a variety of ways. We urge viewers to um, review our other videos on uh, topics ranging from landlord-tenant law uh, to bankruptcy to um, mediation services, as well as all of our training papers, um, now 18, are on our website. If viewers are so inclined, and we would certainly welcome contributions to Call for Justice, uh, this stuff isn't easy to do or cheap, and um, we, um, we appreciate the support of, of viewers of these videos. Our speaker today is Kathleen Davis from Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. She is the government benefit supervising attorney there. She has worked in the area of public benefits for 25 years, and before that, she worked with people over 60 in their seniors unit. Now that she is a senior herself, she works mostly with younger individuals. Strange how that happens. Over the years, she has loved working with individual clients to secure income stability and health care, in addition to doing impact litigation and policy work at both the state and county levels. She is also a lover of the arts, a book club member for 25 years, and a grandmother. Kathleen is also, uh, in Minnesota, probably the leading attorney on government benefits as it relates to serving low-income people in marginalized communities. Please help me welcome Kathleen Davis. Well, thank you, Ellie. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And um, I think the first thing I, I want to say, as I said yesterday, is um, I want to extend First, uh, thank you for um, asking me to speak to you, and also I'd like to thank you for the work that you do, because um, many of the clients that, that we have that come through our organization and are in great need have been referred um, or directed by your organization, and um, it's crucial that people, um, if they can, you know, they, they need some really good referral sources and you're the best. So thank you very much for um, doing what you do. Uh, today I'm, I'm going to try and talk about the um, public benefits generally and I'm going to kind of, um, I want to focus on the kinds of benefits that we at Legal Aid do and, um, and I'm going to try to focus on the kinds of issues that you might see coming through your door. Please um, feel free to jump in at any time with any questions. Uh, yesterday was a really um, fun kind of, you know, exchange of lots of um, questions and answers. And I actually got through the material too, so I felt pretty good about that. Um, but, you know, whenever you, if you have a question, just raise your hand or call out, you know. Um, so I'm going to hopefully get this working here. So let's see here. Um, first of all, I want to talk about um, who our unit serves. I, I supervise our government benefits unit at Legal Aid. We have five, um, let's see, four attorneys, one paralegal. Um, everyone is highly skilled, has been there many years, so um, they really, um, it's, it's, it's a really good group to work with. We, we serve low-income parents, children, and single persons uh, who have problems with initial government benefit eligibility. Uh, termination of government ben uh, benefit eligibility, and then reductions or modifications of government benefits amounts or services. So it's a pretty broad area of the types of things that we do, and um, err on the side, I guess, of, of sending people to us. Um, if we do have a really good intake staff uh, at Legal Aid also, I mean, we wouldn't survive without them. And if if it's not something that we unfortunately can handle for some reason, that, you know, they're very good at giving other referrals too. So, um, uh, and then, let's see here. Sorry, I have to figure out how to do this first. 
Oh, well, that's what I'm doing. Let's see. Oh, I think I have to press this button first, so sorry. Um, let's talk uh, a little bit about just the kinds of cases that we handle. This is a list of the things that we do. Um, I, at the bottom, you'll see that we don't handle veterans' cases. I understand that you had an excellent benefits attorney uh, come to speak to you just recently about um, the work that she does in her organization. Uh, we don't do the uh, benefits cases. And um, when I get to the Retirement Survivors Disability Insurance, RSDI, I will explain that um, really what we do is terminations. We don't really do handle initial eligibility because private attorneys usually um, are more than willing to take those cases because they can get um, part of the retroactive amount, the amount that, that the person is awarded if they win. So um, let's see if I, oops. In terms of government benefit programs, um, just generally some of the elements of a, the basic elements of a government benefits program, um, there's going to usually be some sort of income and asset guidelines. Um, what's interesting right now is that, um, you know, if you, we talk about assets, and again, that means like savings accounts or IRAs or, um, you know, uh, assets, even homes, you know. Um, food, stamp, food stamps now, or SNAP benefits, as I should call it. Um, I'm from the old school when they were called food stamps, and then they went to food support, now they're SNAP. They've taken the asset limit off completely. So that is not even there. And the same with um, the new extended medical assistance for um, parents and single people uh, and children. There is no asset limit for um, medical assistance and Minnesota Care. And so sometimes, you know, some, most programs do have asset and in income limits, but a few don't now. Um, immigration status, of course, is an important one. Um, and depending on the program, um, it might be a more restrictive definition of who is served or a more broad definition. Um, I, I guess that I would add that um, if we are talking about immigrants without documents, um, there's really very few uh, or the only, the major government benefit program that is available to um, these individuals would be uh, emergency medical assistance in the case where they have an emergency. Um, they are in Hennepin County, and you, I'm sure you probably know this, there are other um, medical uh, resources, thank goodness, the last several years that have become available for uh, people in that situation. Um, but as far as any of the other uh, cash benefits, um, they're foreclosed from, from collecting anything. Um, the, the programs that we're dealing with are either uh, administered by the fed, on the federal level, let's say the Social Security Administration handles the SSI and the RSDI, or they are administered um, with, through um, a, federal, a state agency, and then in any programs administered by the Department of Human Services, they are actually administered on the county level, but DEED, um, the Department of Economic oh, Employment and Economic Development, uh, which does the unemployment comp, um, that all the the processing and all the hearings and everything are done at the state agency level. So it just it depends. And then um, I think a really important point, and I think that um, Ellie's uh, document uh, that that she has prepared um, emphasizes very very much is the fact that all of these programs, because they're government programs, have an appeal system. Um, because they are programs that, um, uh, they are entitlement programs, uh, people who um, receive or um, apply for those benefit programs are entitled to adequate specific notice of the decision of the agency they are um, entitled to a clear description of how to appeal, when to appeal, what's your timelines, you know, the process. And they are entitled then to an, um, a hearing through at, at, a, at, the, at the agency level, usually. Um, and then, of course, they, you know, if, if you know, they can, they can get an attorney if they 
are so you know, inclined or are able to get an attorney, but they can also go in pro se. Um, it was interesting, I, uh, I was saying to Ellie that I just today went through a uh, presentation by some administrative law judges, both from the Department of Human Services and from DEED. And they, of course, both said, or the groups, both groups of uh, judges said, it's so much easier if we have an attorney. Um, because one of the rules in both um, the, the area of unemployment comp and in terms of the Department of Public or the Department of Human Services judges that, that um, is that they have the duty if someone is not represented to adequately develop the record. And so they feel that um, they take their jobs very seriously and they feel that they have to both act as the judge and fact finder but also be attempting when someone's not represented to make sure that they get the story out. You know, with an attorney you can help make sure that it's presented adequately and, and that the legal arguments are, and they just, then they said, we just don't have to worry as much, so. Um, so I, um, what, I, what I'd like to do, oh you yes. What, what do you often find is the cause for, uh, or what do people often take for, or to, like their arguments for appealing, and what are the, the common things that uh, they would appeal against anyway? Well, I mean, the, 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 the types of cases that come in um, often, it just, I guess it depends on the benefit, but let's say with the MFIT program, um, which is the family program I'm going to talk about now, I would say that um, initial denials problems with verification so that you know there's delays in getting decisions sometimes a, um, a family will get denied because they weren't able to adequately verify even though there is the duty of the uh, county agency to assist in, in verifications um, people that are all, are on the benefit program um, might get terminated because they didn't follow through again with recertification um, because they're no longer because the county thinks they're no longer eligible. Um, if it's an unemployment comp case, they might get, um, they would apply for unemployment comp. The employer responds and says, uh, wait a second, this person was fired and it was because of misconduct or this person quit. Therefore, um, the, ag the agency says, well, then they're not entitled to benefits. We get to represent them in, in that type of issue. Um, sometimes it's a medical service issue for uh, health care. Um, a lot of initial, and then with SSI and RSDI or and, and you know the disability programs, cash disability, um, basically again proving that a person is um, eligible to receive the SSI benefit. For example, they meet the disability standard. Um, so those are kind of the some of the standard things that we do. Now, I, just to throw in, I'll, I'll let you know that. Um, another thing that we do at Legal Aid and we, we spend a lot of time doing is a lot of policy work. So as we see problems coming in, and it's the same problem with the, you know, oh, hmm, 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 three people. The first one, it's an anomaly or it's a, just an individual client. By the time you get to three, it's like, wow, we've got a possible problem with the system. So then we start to look at that. We meet with either the county or we talk to the state about the problem or deed possibly. Uh, Social Security, you don't really talk to that much because they're a little bit more, they're difficult. Although we have had um, meetings uh, a couple, several years ago about um, uh, trans, the interpreting and accessibility issues in terms of people who don't speak English. So, um, you know, then we so then we look at it as a broader issue and try to um, approach it so that so that instead of having each individual client come in, um, we can kind of prevent a lot of people from coming in because the because it's fixed at the county or the state level. Okay. Cool. okay. Can I ask you? Um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you'd know this, but um, for the SNAP benefits, they've changed some of the requirements lately. Are people having to attend like employment counseling and that type of thing to maintain their benefits? Well, it depends on the on on the category of person, and I and I'm not gonna I, I'm not I can't be real specific, but I can tell you that yes, they did change for single, able-bodied, or actually single and couple able-bodied. Persons without children. Okay. Okay. And and what happened was that our Congress several years ago said we are going to limit those people to three months 
in three years, and that's it, unless, unless they are in a specific type of training program. Okay. And it's a little difficult because I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not sure that they, that training program even exists at this point. And actually, that's something we're going to put on the, you've just reminded me, I, we actually have a monthly meeting with the, count, uh, the top people of the county every month, and I want to find out what happened because um, are you finding that people are calling and saying we don't know what, where the, what program to participate in? Right, or or they have cut off from benefits, and what do I do now? Yeah. Well, and it is true that as long as, uh, if they are disabled, that's one thing, but if they're able-bodied, they get three months and three years unless they're participating in uh, one of these employment programs. And I need to check with the county because they were going to get it up and running, and that, I don't know that we, and we had actually put this on our agenda s several months ago, and I think we need to follow up on this. So thank you for reminding me. Do they get a, do they get a list of places where they can go for training? Because I have received a call where a caller was asking where they can go for employment training. So that well, they and that's, training. see, and I don't know. I, I really don't know the answer to that right now. Let me find out, and what is the best way to coordinate getting an answer? Through Ellie. Yeah, through Ellie. To, yeah, send it to me, and okay. then I'll get I'll right. get it to uh, Jackie, our liaison. Okay, so. because uh, yeah, if you're if you're getting calls like this, we need to we need to make sure that there is an agency available. The problem is, if I recall, it's it's discretionary under the law, so it's not exactly something that we um, that you know is gives us a legal basis for saying you must do it. But I know the county was aware of the issue. But we have to find, I have to find out what it is, even for myself, too. Okay. The problem was that for a while, we did, in fact, cover those people. When we were going through the recession, the, um, the Congress gave us the, uh, the states the permission to put those, those people on. And it's just recently, I think, it's, I think the law says something like it, when your employment, unemployment rate goes below, I believe, 6% or something, then you flip back to the three, mo three months and three years. And unfortunately, I mean, fortunately in some sense, but for these people, unfortunately, we're there now. So they're back to the three months and three years. But I will definitely um, check that because because I have to for, for my <laughs> clients too. So, and like I said, we did discuss it and then we have these meetings, we put, and, and I make an agenda, and I, frankly, most of the time has been spent on healthcare recently, surprise, surprise, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like what's going on with the county, what's <clears throat> going on with the state, well, you know, and then we're, but as clients come in and we have problems, we bring that, the, again, that's one of the places if we have a, a two or three person problem, we say, mm, we're going to the county, we're going to talk to you. And, you know, it actually has worked because we have not sued the county for several years. We've been able to really get re results, yeah, because we sit at the same table and we discuss the issue and, and then we keep putting on the agenda until it gets resolved. So I'm going to put it back on the agenda. And Jennifer, Kathleen will get to appeals, but to answer your question specifically, if people are calling us, they've been cut off, they don't know what to do, Two, two answers. First is refer them to legal aid or to Smurls or wherever they are geo geographically located for their legal aid organization. And then the second answer would be look at your paper. If there's an appeal process on this paper that's talking about you need to do that as soon as we're done with the telephone call. Okay? Right. They could go. They, they certainly, if they're doing an appeal, um, that actually might be an effective way too because it raises the issue to the county level. The problem is going to be that if they got their notice three months ago and they're calling now, you know, that could be a problem. But right. uh, we'll talk more about that. Okay, um, I'd like to start with the government benefits for families. What I kind of do, did is try to kind of separate out families, single people, and then we're going to talk um, a little bit about disabled people. Um, and we have Zoe and Jose uh, Zalopa. Zolopa, okay. Um, they are parents of two minor children, and um, they're, neither of them are employ, employed, and so what be government benefits are they um, eligible for, or can they receive? And <laughs> it would have been much easier, I think, if... Um, okay. Um, the first thing is that the family is available, or is eligible, probably, for MFIP. Um, there is a one-month residency 
requirement in Minnesota, so if they just came, it might be that they're going to have to wait a month. Um, and since MFIP is a welfare to work program, um, you know, they're going to pretty quickly be uh, sent to an employment counselor and the big thing is to get them back or get them to work. Um, the MFIP program provides cash and SNAP benefits, medical assistance, and then child care if needed, which of course would be needed if they're going to be doing job search to find a job. Um, in Minnesota right now, a family of four, um, they would receive 621 in cash um, and 569 in food support. Um, the MFIP is um, a time-limited benefit, so it is it has um, a five-year limit. Um, oops, let me just I gotta put the one more there. Let me just make sure there's okay. Oh, okay. Um, if the person is receiving, if the family is receiving food only, the, those months don't count. Um, there are some exemptions from just the five-year limit, um, and the big one is that they are victims of, fam of family violence. But of course, it's not so easy as just saying, I'm a victim of family violence. They're going to have to have some proof, um, and I, I'm hoping that someone has come in and talked to you about um, family violence waivers. Uh, we have actually, I'll give one of these to Ellie and you can, this is a really good synopsis that was done by Ellen Smart, one of the attorneys in our office, about how to uh, get a family violence waiver and what, um, what is required to establish that um, you are a victim of family violence. Uh, you don't have to have an OFP, that's number one, and number two, um, you might still be living in the house, in the home with the abuser. You don't have, to, I mean, it's not like if you're still living in there, we don't count it as, as violence. I mean, I think, and those are two areas that I've run into recently where employment service providers, sometimes counselors don't understand that. But Ellen just gave a good training to, um, to the employment service providers, so hopefully they're going to be a little more up-to-date in terms of Hennepin County. A um, couple other exemptions from the five years. Um, a caregiver is over six, 60. Um, the, pers the child, the, the person is 18 or 19, receiving EMFA, but also attending school and then living in Indian country. Um, but now, in addition, um, and I think the really important part here, at, and, and this is also sometimes what we get calls about, is that, we, that families can get extensions beyond the five years. Um, and there's a number of bases. Uh, what happens is that when a family reaches the five-year limit, um, there is a specific procedure that the county is supposed to go through um, and asking very specific questions to determine whether the family has a basis for continuing beyond the five-year extension. Um, some of the extensions would be um, that the, the person is experiencing um, has a serious injury or illness that prevents them from working. Um, they have a mental illness that prevents them from working. And the preventing from working is um, a six-month standard at this point, so they look at it every six months. The person is um, uh, experiencing family violence. Um, the person has uh, an IQ or a, a learning disability, which again, um, either prevents them from gaining employment or makes it very difficult for them to be employed. Um, or um, another exception is that they are working um, 25 hours plus job search uh, or doing some additional activity another five hours a week and still have not been able to essentially work their way off the cash. So in other words, it's a very low wage um, family. And so then they would be, they are allowed to be extended. Um, so we actually, I mean, there's a fair number of people that are extended in Hennepin County. Um, and that's something that, you know, when families come in, what am I going to do? I'm at the end of my five years that we would certainly do a lot of um, talking to families about. Oh, there's an, another, I just remembered another one. It's caring for a disabled um, child or a disabled 
a family member, uh, so, uh, an adult who is seriously and persistently uh, mentally ill, or caring for a child who meets the severely emotionally disturbed standard. So there are a fair number of categories. The question is whether you fit into one, and that's kind of how we, we work. Yes? How long is the exemption, or how long do they extend the extension? What they do is they look at them every six months. Six months. So, um, and you know, like, it has to be a, um, a medical certification. It's got a, there's a form. The doctor signs a form. So, you know, you might have somebody who has experiencing a mental uh, health issue, but, you know, once they get on medication and they stabilize, the doctor is no w longer willing to say that the person cannot work. So could it go on? So could they receive, possibly receive benefits for like another five years if there's they no the there's no months. limit and it's they they receive them then as long as that condition exists and they have chi children minor children mm -hmm. because of course once the minor they're if they have no no longer have children then right. they're not eligible for MFIP anymore did you have a question yeah if <laughs> say you get to the end of your five years and you're employed yes and then you get to a point where you lose your job. Can you apply for an extension at that point in time? You can, again, if you meet one of the criteria. Now, the first thing that's going to happen if you lose your job is you're going to probably, hopefully, apply for unemployment comp. And in most cases, the unemployment comp might be actually more than the MFIP. Um, and so that's really the first place that you want to go. But let's say uh, you were fired for misconduct. You lose your hearing or you can't get it, you know because, you know, even with an, a legal aid attorney, you're not going to be able to get it, you know. Um, yeah, then, you, then, then the question is, again, you have to go back and look at whether the person meets one of those criteria. I mean, is the reason that, that they were fired really because they were experiencing such a serious mental health issue that, in fact, they probably can't work? You know, those kinds of issues. It's not an, I mean, because it's not an automatic extension, um, but clearly there's nothing that, that prevents you from going back in after you've been off, for, you know, out, you've used the five years. If you meet one of those, even if it's a three, four, five years beyond, you can still go back and try to qualify for an extension. The five-year limit, let's just say, for example, I myself applied for it, and then I got benefits for a year, and I got a job, and it was paying good, and I stopped, and then I lost my job, and then I applied again. Does that mean that one year would be the year I was on it, and then if I was on it for another two more years, that would be added to that five years? No. Is that correct? Or no. no? Okay. Everything okay. is, once you get five years, it cuts off, okay. and the only, reason, the only way you're going to get a basis beyond the five years is if you meet one of those criteria. It doesn't start a, the five years again or anything like that. Okay. So, you know, I mean, you, you only get it for the time period that you meet the criteria. You know, you have a serious illness, your child is having a, a crisis, and, and you can establish that um, they meet the severely emotionally disturbed okay. standard, which, by the way, um, I mean, I think that people, you know, that sounds really... Extreme, and it is extreme, but I mean, you know, it, serious emotional disturbance means that you are really having serious problems in home, community, or school, and um, you've got a diagnosis, like, you know, kids have the ADHD possibly, or, you know, depression. I mean, it's possible that the child has an IEP, is really having problems in school, and is seeing a therapist that, in fact, they, uh, they may, in fact, meet the, uh, the severely emotionally disturbed standard. And it's not like the county worker, when they're doing that last meeting, is going to, I mean, depending on the person, they may not really look behind and say, well, you know, let's talk about, you know, instead of saying, well, is your, on, is your child on SSI? Well, of course, then they're disabled. But no, let's look beyond that. I mean, what kind, are, is your child having some problems at school? You know, is the child seeing therapists? Is the child on medication? Does the child, I mean, well, maybe then they meet the SED standard too. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing, you know, again, and I'm not, ex certainly in no way would be expecting you to, to do that kind of work, but that's the kind of work we do in terms of looking at those cases. Um, then. Along a different line, I've had families tell me that because they were working and making a certain amount of money, they were making too much money before that then they can't qualify for MFIP if, like, they've lost their job and they've run out of unemployment. Is that possible? 
or are they not understanding what they've been told by the county? Um, I don't think it's possible. I think you can, you know, it might be possible that, um, mm, like, because no. MPIP's not based on your fi finances at all. It's based on, I mean, it's not based on your past finances. No, it's based no. on your present no, situation. No, it's right? your present situation, exactly. Okay. What they might be talking about is that, um, let's say they have not been on MFIP before and they, are un they lose their job. Um, they're going to apply for MFIP and they're going to be told, you are going to be um, diverted into the Diversionary Work pro Project, which is a part of MFIP, and I'm going to actually, that's the next thing I was going to just mention. And, in, and, and that, that makes them eligible, but um, what happens is that you then get vendor paid, your expenses get vendor paid, and depending on um, what's left, you might get a $70 personal needs allowance. So that it might be, it could actually end up being less than what you would get under the monthly grant. And that's a four month program. But if you've been on MFIP before, and then you go and you're employed, and then you lose your job, and you get and your employ, unemployment ends, and you go again, and, you, and you've been on before, you'll go right into MFIP. But if you've not been, then you go into this diversion. But that really is part of MFIP. It's our legislator, legislature has decided that People, when they first apply for MFIP, um, they should really have to show that they can't get a job. So they have to go immediately into this very rapid exit kind of, or rapid job search kind of program and get, you know, some small amounts of money. And that's supposed to encourage people to really get a job. And then if they can't really get a job in four months, then they are transferred to the MFIP program. Okay. Um, then just uh, most el immigrants uh, that are permanently and legally here are eligible for MFIP. Um, and, and basically, uh, some of them will not be receive federal money, but we provide state money then for, um, but again, it's, it, you know, and then it, I'm not going to get into the immigrant issue, but, you know, I mean, if there's sponsors and things become very, can become much more complicated. Um, all right, let's see if I can. Um, when I say other MFIP programs, um, you know, again, this is the diversionary uh, work project I was just talking about, program I was just talking about. Um, quick entry into work is emphasized. And then the other program is the Family Stabilization Services Program. And essentially, all those, that group of people that I was telling you about that are, are eligible for the extensions, beyond the five years. If you have those same barriers, but you're within the five years, what happens is that they just move you to a different program. It's called, it's still MFIP. Most people don't even necessarily know, except that they are no longer, it's called the Family Stabilization Services. They're no longer um, hooked up with an employment counselor. They go to a different program. Um, and the, the, the key here is to stabilize them, um, help them work through uh, disabilities, eventually maybe get them into employment, maybe eventually get them to, the, to SSI for disability, um, you know, try to work with their barriers. Um, but the other reason that we, we uh, set up this program in terms of legislature is because if you take these families out of the MFIP program and, and pay them state money, then our work participation rate goes up. <coughs> and for the feds, that's really important in terms of us getting money and not losing funding. And so several years ago, le the legislature said, Linda Berglund especially said, hmm, we got to do something about this. Um, the other thing about family stabilization services is um, uh, sanctions. And I think that's the next, um, let me just see if I can. One of the big problems and one of the things that we're going to see, uh, we see a lot of in our program are people that are, re are sanctioned. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to go back. Um, what sanctions means is that your grant is cut. Um, and if you're not doing one of these things, if, you seem to, if you're not cooperating with something like this, like you're not in school and you're a minor parent, or you're, um, you're not cooperating with child support, you haven't attended an MFIP meeting, 
um, orientation overview or, or just general meeting, you quit a job without a good reason, um, or you're, you have an employment plan that you are not following, you get sanctioned. The employment service counselor uh, tells the, in our, in our county, will then tell the county um, time to sanction, um, and the first cut is 10%. Then the next six, the next, uh, let's see, it's, set, uh, it's the next five months is 30% cut, and then by the seventh month, it's 100% cut. And I did check with um, another attorney today because the question I got is, is there a limit in terms of the number of times you can um, have the 100% sanction? And she said yes. She thinks too. So basically, uh, and the problem is once you're off, you, you, are, um, you have to reapply to get back on. And you have to cooperate and try and do what you didn't do. Um, and this is difficult. Now, one of the things about this program, or one of the things that we do is um, we work a lot with families in sanction. Um, we actually, a letter from us, our office goes to the county, from, is sent from the county to each of the persons in sanction every month telling them about us. Um, and we um, either uh, try to find a basis for arguing that there was good cause and, and to go back and lift retroactively, lift the sanction or lift it now, um, or uh, we do mediation. We try to, you know, hook the person back up with, with the counselor if we can't find a basis for retro lifting. Um, but what, this, is a, this is a place where we're going to find people that maybe should be in the Family Stabilization Services program but kind of have been flying below the radar. So, for example, they may, in fact, be have a serious mental illness. They may be seeing a therapist. Um, they just don't, they just fall off the radar in terms of their counselor because they're so depressed. They don't tell their counselor that they're experiencing that depression, or they might tell them, but nothing happens. So when we get involved, A, we get the sanction lifted, hopefully get it lifted retroactively if we can get that certification, and also then um, have them moved into the Family Stabilization Services Program. So there's a lot of moving back and forth. Um, Are but, you ever able to advocate for like a change of um, like their counselor, like they just don't get along, the, the person is trying to provide the paperwork they need, the counselor's still, you know, cutting them off or sanctioning them. Can you ever advocate for like a change? Uh, we can advocate, but it's pretty difficult. Um, the uh, Hanneman County takes, even with us, takes a very firm view that they don't like to transfer you from one counselor to another. Um, if, it's, if it's very clear to me there's, you know, an issue of discrimination or um, something, um, I might, yes, and, and uh, you know, again, because we've been working in the system so long and because we know the people at the top, you know, if I really think there's a problem, I'll go right up to the top eventually and say, you've got to do something about this. But it, it's really hard. So it's, you know, the key for them is trying to get out, of, out away from them somehow, you know, because it, in the sense of, either getting a job or, you know, um, somehow getting to a point where they don't have to have as much interaction. It's difficult because there are some counselors that probably aren't as pleasant as others. I'll just say it and leave it at that. <laughs> Remember you're on video. That's right. <laughs> um, now, the other thing that you get, again, like I said, is MFIP child care assistance. Um, while you're on MFIP, you can get child care and you can do jo for job search, training, employment, and education. Um, if you find a job, uh, you move into what's called uh, uh, transitional child care assistance. You get that for a year, and then you continue. Once you're in, once you're in that, you can continue into what's called basic sliding fee child care, and, and as long as you remain low income, which is, I believe, um, below 200 percent. Oh, sorry. Um, of uh, FPG, you can continue to get child care. You have a copay. You know, you're gonna as your income goes up, you pay some more. But you know, but this is a problem. This is a, a definitely, and you may see some problems with this because the problem is that if someone has not been on MFIP for three months, and so then has not been able to move into transitional childcare, they're stuck with applying for basic sliding fee. And as I'm sure you all know, there is a horrendous waiting list for basic sliding fee childcare. And um, about every three or four years, if there's money, and there hasn't been now for a couple years, 
the legislature will allocate some money to clean up the, the list. I mean, you know, they'll allocate some more money, and what the county does is just clean up the list, you know, and then it starts again. So, um, you know, there are, there are, there are the, you know, that you might, I, sometimes I have to advise the person that they might have to, um, if they can work it so they can quit their job for three months, go on MFIP, and then move into transitional and child care, they got the child care. But, I mean, it's, there's not a lot of uh, ways around the, to get the basic sliding fee because there's such a long waiting list. It's not great. Um, and I wish we could get more. Uh, and, of course, the family is eligible for um, health care. As an MFIB recipient, of course, they're eligible for medical assistance. Now, as parents um, earn their way off of MFIB, they continue to receive the MFIB or medical assistance. Children are eligible up to 250%, 75% of federal poverty guidelines, which for a family of four is um, over 64,000, as you see, um, and will continue to get medical assistance. Um, oops, what's going on here? Ah, okay. Um, parents are eligible. Now, this is a, a change with the extension, uh, the ex expanded MA. Um, parents used to be only eligible up to 100. Now they're uh, eligible up to 133 percent. Um, so again, for a family of four, you can see, you know, it's 31,000. And what happens then is the parents are moved to Minnesota Care, up to um, 200 percent of FPG. Um, the Minnesota Care, you're going to pay a premium, but again, it's probably a lot cheaper and it's much more broad coverage than you're going to get in most insurance companies or with most insurance policies. Um, so if you're beyond the 200 percent, then you're going to be going through Minsure. You're going to be per up to 400 percent. You're going to be going through Minsure, purchasing private insurance, and you're going to get a, a premium tax credit, um, which might be substantial depending on your income and, and your family, uh, the number of people in your family. So, I mean, there's been big changes in this, re in this respect, and I can tell you that it's already made an incredible impact on a lot of families to be able to get that kind of health care. Even, like, I mean, I have families that are were on very low income, and the, and the mom, I had helped her with unemployment comp, and she said, oh, I'm not eligible for uh, MA because, you know, I know my unemployment comp was, I did the calculation, I said, you are now eligible as of January 1. So the, it is, and, and um, for Minnesota Care, they took out the four-month waiting period. I think it, you know that. You know, the, the $10,000 cap for uh, hospitalization, which uh, pays her one day maybe, um, or an hour. Um, that is gone in terms of single adults. It's, all, it's all, never been in for families or for children, but for adults it's been in. So there's a lot of good changes. Um, essentially, the, the coverage under Minnesota Care is probably pretty, is about the equivalent you'd get in medical assistance. Um, so it's, it's very, it's a really positive change. Now, if you can get in and actually apply, that would be the big thing. And of course, you know, we're working on that, I guess. <laughs> As you know, there have been some problems with that. Um, the family, uh, because they are um, eligible for MFIP, um, they might, if they have an emergency, they're eligible for medical or uh, emergency assistance. But um, the other thing about uh, that is that even families who are not eligible for MFIP um, may be eligible for emergency assistance. Um, each county has their own. It's, the limit is 250 FPG um, for the family. Each county has its own emergency assistance policy. So what Hennepin is going to do is going to probably going to be different from Ramsey's, what Ramsey is going to do. And we do take emergency assistance cases. We do work a lot of them out. Um, and there is an expedited um, hearing process, so you can do it pretty quickly. Um, sometimes not quickly enough. Uh, we also have, you know, they either work through our family, our housing law, or through the benefits, or we work together. You know, sometimes if they're in, in UD court, it might be, they, we might never see them because they'll just be the housing people sending them to EA. All right, let's see what we've got here. Um, and in terms of appeals, um, 
again, uh, for MFIP, healthcare, child care assistance, um, any of the programs that were food, SNAP, um, the, these programs you appeal through to the Department of Human Services. They have actually, I think they said now 60, 60 ALJs. I mean, they have an incredible number of ALJs now up there because of the, the whole new health care program. Um, and, okay. So when we're talking about appeals, it's the important thing you got, you know, we've, we've talked about this is, uh, you know, just tell them appeal right away. Don't try to count the days, just say, you know, appeal right away. Uh, if you appeal within 10 days or before the effective date of the action, you can ask for benefits pending appeal. Um, a lot of people get it to us before, after that, and so they, their benefits have been cut off. Um, you have to appeal within 30 days. However, if you have good cause, you can appeal up to 90 days. 90 days is the absolute drop dead cutoff uh, point. You know, let's say you were in the hospital or you were, you know, there's, there are reasons why there are bases for good cause between the 30 and the 90 days in terms of appeals. Um, can I interrupt, Kathleen? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and yesterday, this uh, came up with, you know, somebody who's on the phone, they've got, an, they've got some document they're looking at, they're telling you, I don't fully understand it, but it says something about appeal and I know I'm gonna, either lose my benefits or they're gonna be reduced, what do you do, you know? And, and as Kathleen said, we don't wanna be counting the days for them over the telephone. We wanna stay away from that. Um, we wanna do tell them, you need to get this appeal filed as soon as you're done with this phone call. But they say, well, I don't know what to do. I wanna to talk to somebody about it. A good place for us to send folks is to the county law libraries. Remember the, you know, the Metro County Law Libraries who have human beings associated with them, you know, very eager the law librarians are. Some of them are having clinics, you know, once a month, but if they go to the law library, chances are they're going to be able to talk to somebody. The librarians can't give them legal advice, but certainly can help them understand what the form has to say. So that's a good, good fallback for us. Yes, Anne. Um, I just wanted to mention for the benefit of the new people that we do list the appeals number as well under okay. the county. So in case you guys need to find that information, it's, it's listed with the county service. Great. Now well, appealing is just gonna make it so that <clears throat> they'll give you like a retroactive like assistance for what Excuse you're me. trying. Cause like if, you, if they deny you and say it's past 90 days, you can still reapply. You right? can always reapply. You've lost your retroactive amounts, but Okay, absolutely. so that's retroactive yeah. Yeah. Um, like yeah. Because you hadn't provided yeah, them. Yeah, you can always reapply. Order. Yeah. Okay. Most people want to get that retroactive amount though too. And again, if they if they appeal before the within ten days or before the effective date, then they can get the benefits pending appeal. And I was just uh, again going, you know, I was just thinking of this when I went to this presentation today. Um, with a deed, um, the judges from the the from deed said, you know, we don't really care. If they all they say one of if all they say is I want to appeal, that's enough. You don't have to say and da 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 da. This is the reason, you know. And they, you know, it can be done in writing. It can be done online now through DHS and Minsure and Deed. But you know, I thought you could only do it through online through Deed. But no, that you can do it by writing. Um, they, you know, you can fax it in. You can mail it in. You can. Drop it off. Probably deliver it. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I I encourage people to um, deliver it to the the county offices. You know, um, you know they because like with with in Hennepin County now a lot of people are using the Brooklyn Center office. You know the Hennepin County offices out there because there's parking as opposed to Century Plaza where it's really hard to park and you have to pay and everything. You don't have to pay out there. And you know, it's just get it to someone here. I want to appeal. You know, I want to appeal. That's all. Name, date, and Max's number if you're, you know, your case number if, if it's, you know, really helps if you're uh, doing it through, um, for um, any kind of government benefits through the county. Um, but it can be sent to DHS too. It can be faxed. It can be, I, you know, I wouldn't email it, and they suggested that they don't, they're not going to be looking at emails. So, But on the other hand, if you're going through the Minsure system, there's a, there's a way you can actually do it through on computer. And, um, and certainly with Deed, 
unemployment comp, you can actually appeal right on, online. And I think that particularly for this um, area, um, it, once we have uh, Kathleen's video up on our website, um, that may be a very good place to send somebody if they're panicking, you know, to hear what Kathleen has to say, particularly about appeals. Now, um, the next, so it kind of, that kind of covers the families, you know, it's a brief and it's a brief overview, but um, I'd like to move into a couple other areas. Um, well, this could be a family or could be a single person, but in this case, Jose loses his job. Is he eligible for any public benefits? And it's possible that he might be eligible for unemployment compensation. Um, to... <coughs> To get it, you can you can apply online. Um, you can go to a computer at one of the workforce centers. Um, you um, okay? Uh, it's through the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Assistance. They're the ones that administer the program. They're also where the judges are. Um, the benefits usually last um, 26 weeks. Um, there's some complicated uh, calculations that would determine uh, how much you will get from in terms of your benefit. Um, and the st we, what we, we do unemployment comp hearings and the two kind of major issues that we see are uh, I was fired and then the employer has appealed saying it was due to misconduct. And then the other one is I quit, um, but I fall into one of the 10 categories, um, I, you know, reasons why I quit and I should still be able to get public benefits or get the unemployment comp. Um, I have found, we have found that, you know, uh, you know, employers get charged for this. You know, this is expensive if they have a client, uh, an employee that is going to get unemployment comp. So if they fired somebody, they might want, and it looks like the person's going, and they're mad at the person anyway, you know, for some reason. Um, if the person's going to apply for unemployment, they're just like, forget it, we're going to appeal this. The, you know, but the problem, and, they're gonna, and we're going to allege misconduct, the problem um, often is that it really isn't misconduct. Um, the, there's a definition of misconduct, um, and the, defini uh, the statutory definition of misconduct is serious violation of standards of behavior that the employer has the right to expect or substantial lack of concern for employment. Now, on the other hand, the statute also says that what is not misconduct, and this is what, is what we do a lot of arguing about, is simple unsatisfactory conduct, uh, inefficiency, inadvertence, mental illness, um, mental illness that causes uh, an inability or incompetency. Um, basically, there are reasons, I mean, you know, just because the person can't do the job and didn't do it very well, that doesn't mean he's engaged or she is engaged in misconduct. And you know, there's sometimes it's a fine line, but basically a lot of hearings we, we have have to do with whether someone has engaged in misconduct. Yes? I'm sorry, what is, what is inadvertence? I'm sorry, what? What is inadvertence? Mm, they didn't really mean it to do it. It was an accident. Like, negl like neg negligence. Okay. For example, you, you uh, back the company truck into a pole and you dent the truck. Mm -hmm. Like an accident. Yep. Yeah, yep. and yep. and that you can show that it really, well, yeah. I mean, I guess they might say, well, you could have been, you know. I mean, if you can prove that it really was inadvertent. I mean, I was something happened, or you know, I, you know what I mean. Like I, I just recently backed my car into something, so I can, I can attest that it is kind of. I do think it's inadvertent. So I agree. <laughs> um, I rest it, my case. <laughs> there we go. You know. Anyway, um, so. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a fine line sometimes, and it's, that's why a person often um, could certainly use an attorney because we can really um, try to marshal the facts and, and, you know, try to have the person more organized when they give the presentation, do some cross-examination of the other side if necessary. Um, sometimes a lot of the information that's coming in from the employer is what we call hearsay. It's the person who... Um, who 
somehow was insulted or injured or whatever, I don't know, uh, or the supervisor isn't even there to testify. And so they're just saying, well, such and such said this, this, and this. Well, that's not really, I mean, it is hearsay and it's going to come in, but, you know, if my client is here and my client is testifying, that's not what really happened. I'm under oath and I'm going to tell you what really happened. And the judge gets to, to judge the credibility. You know, I'm going to argue that my client is more credible than somebody reading off a piece of paper not being subject to cross-examination, you know. And so I think that, and, and the proponents of the evidence should weigh in favor of my client. So, you know, that kind of thing happens a, actually a lot. So, and the judges, it was really interesting because the, judge the judges did say, you know, I mean, you know, they, they do look at that. They do weigh if someone's really there and organized and answers straightforward and gives the, you know, and the other person is reading, well, such and such, they're going to probably give greater weight to the person who was there. So anyway, um, I kind of digress a little bit, but. And one of the things we do need to paint, you know, the picture here is that these hearings, for the most part, are taking over the telephone. So Always you've got, the you know, an yeah. administrative law judge who was really a lawyer, um, who's sitting in an office, a deed office, and has on the phone the employer at the employer's <laughs> place of business, has on the phone the claimant or the person who's unemployed at, at wherever they are, sometimes they're at their attorney's office or sometimes they're at their home. And a witness possibly or two. And a witness or two. And so this, you know, so it's not like a courtroom where you have a judge in a robe and, you know, that judge will hear all the evidence and, and people get called to the stand and somebody, you know, swears them in right before they get to the stand and the, and the court reporter, that type of thing. So it's important for people who are going through hearings with unemployment to understand that there is some informality associated with it, but it does not mean that it isn't very important because it is critical, very, very critical. Absolutely. I mean, they were saying, you know, I mean, we, we really listen very carefully, and if someone is, is not answering very um, straightforwardly, you know, we'll, we can pick that up. You know, I mean, there's a lot... A lot going on there. Now, if the, if the person is un, unrepresented, again, it is the judge's role to try and develop the record as adequately as possible. And, it's, and it does sound like, you know, the ones, the judges that were here uh, that, that I heard today, you know, they, they're very conscientious about that, you know. Um, then, you know. Hold on are, a second. You've got oh, a question? Um, yes. The biggest issue that I've heard from callers is, they keep track of their unemployment benefits. They're, they're either looking online each week or they're getting sent information. And then they think they have X number of weeks or because they have that much money left and all of a sudden they're cut off. Do you know why that happens? Or is there anything that they can do about that? Well, not really, except for, you know, they just watch very carefully. I mean, I think if they really were watching online, they would they would know when their benefits are going to end. And then a lot they of don't just get cut off kind of arbitrarily. It will be when when the amount that they have that the the state is working with based on their earnings and then the number of weeks when that amount is paid out, that's it. They don't get any more. Okay. Unless like, you know, the the feds enact additional unemployment comp which they very well might again, it sounds like. But, you know, for a while during the recession, I mean, we were talking about, you know, like, I don't know, 50, 50 months, uh, 50 weeks of, of unemployment comp. Well, it's gone back now to, you know, that's the other thing. People were getting more for a while, and now they're not because, again, you know, the, the extensions, the federal extensions, have, um, they're, they have ended because, because our economy is better. I'm sorry, Gwen. And then I've also had people tell me that um, they were cut off and they were told like to reapply like in March or something and then they go to reapply in March and they're told, well, no, you have to wait a full year to reapply again. Do you know what that means? I mean, we get half stories on the phone a lot, yeah. so I'm just telling you what I've, yeah, what I've been told. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, I'm not sure. And you know, the problem is we'd probably get that question too and then we'd have to go in and look at it and try and figure out why what happened you know 
So in that case, would it be a good referral to send them to you and tell them to bring their paperwork with them? Well, or? you could you could definitely have them call our office. I mean, this is again if it's in Hennepin County, and you know we'll probably um, talk to them on the phone definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, if they give us their password, you know we can go in and look. We might do a lot of the work on 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 right on right there on the phone online and be able to tell them this is this this is that um, another option sometimes is for them to come in bring the papers and then actually we with them call to the office to deed and actually they have very I'm I would I'm very you know I'm I, I'm I've had really good experiences actually with the people that I've talked to there they've been very helpful and um, I felt very accurate um, in their responses so um, because sometimes people just get so tied up because they, you know, if they don't put the right thing the first time, it, it just then keeps following them and they never, and they're in this, they're told, they're cut off benefits when all they have to do is go back and do one little thing, tweak it, and then, and show that they actually are actually actively seeking or actually available to work and then the benefit can restart. But I, you know, I can never know until I've actually have the client with me or on the phone and, and talk to them and talk to Deed. Remember the BLM also is doing unemployment work, um, handling unemployment appeals. Mm -hmm. not, not, um, un not after once a decision has been made, but they'll handle the before the decision has been made. The other thing is, and I don't know if you're going to get to this, no, Kathleen, can, but yeah. so remember, so the process is you get, you lose your job, you file for unemployment, um, you get a letter then from Deed that says your employer has contested the unemployment. Then you file something back and say, well, you know, I disagree with this, and then they set it for hearing. Well, no, then you actually get a denial, and then you appeal. You get the denial. Okay, you get the denial. <laughs> they they you, say, oh, we believe the employer. That's correct. <laughs> that's correct. You get the denial, and then you appeal, and then there's a hearing, and then after that hearing, either the employer or the employee can appeal to the next level. That next level of appeals, there is a clinic um, through the, the Supreme Court um, Law Library where they are uh, using uh, volunteer lawyers to help um, people who are in that next level of appeals. So, um, and in uh, your cheat sheet, uh, the cheat sheet that we've created, we, we've got listed the State Supreme Court uh, Law Library as a resource, and it's the State Supreme Court Law Library that's handling the clinics. So. It's a really excellent program started by Tom Boyd um, at one of the law firms, and you know we also w often will refer. I mean, what what we will do at Legal Aid is um, take the case, take it a hearing, do a reconsideration, and then if there, we feel there's a legal basis, then we might, um, then we would take it, we would take it to the Court of Appeals. But if we don't feel there's a legal basis, we would then not because that's part of our agreement with the, the client that we're not gonna appeal everything up to the, to the Supreme Court on you know, every case. Um, so, but there are, or if someone comes in after having the hearing, we probably won't look at them. But they can actually go and they could do their own pro se with assistance or with an attorney if an attorney is uh, willing to take the case. Right. So um, it's a great thing. Now the, the deed hearings are the ones that are the 20 day deals if you missed that one, like I said, they they were real clear. You're you know you don't have any, any um, recourse except that um, I know that you know we have legislative uh, advocates, attorneys that work at the legislature. They're very busy right now, and one of the things that I know is in you know has been proposed, and it sounds like Deed is on board with is the possibility of extending the appeal period to 45 days. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. You know it's it's in the meat grinder over there, so we'll see. But, but usually if the agency um, supports it, we can usually get it um, passed. So, so it's still gonna be a drop dead 45 days then, not a 20 day. But 20 days is, is the shortest of all the benefit program um, appeal limits. Um, Kathleen, you've got about 20 minutes to okay. get everything done. Actually, no, we're moving along pretty well. I think we're gonna be okay here. So uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The next cat, the next person that we're dealing with is, um, oops, oops, uh, Jose's.
cousin Juan, now he's unemployed and he has some disabilities. Is he eligible for public benefits? Um, well, depending upon, well, first of all, if he comes to our office and he has some disabilities, but he's not on SSI or has not applied, the first thing I'm going to say is, are you an eligible, have you, do you, are you receiving general assistance? And if not, and I do occasionally have someone that doesn't know about it, um, general assistance is a program you'd need a medical certification to say that you can't work for at least 30 days. Um, there are other, because of either a physical or a mental impairment, um, there's some other bases, several other bases under which you could get general assistance. That's the major, the two major categories. Um, and it's the 203, it's the bottom safety net amount that, and I'm sure you probably have people call in. Um, many of the people who get this are homeless, you know, or they, you know, if they're not, they're in some sort of group home situation. I mean, you know, if for 203, you know, or, it, or some of them have gotten into public housing so they can afford to be in public housing. They're also eligible for food stamps and um, they get medical assistance. Um, so they're in, but the, you know. Now, um, let me just. If they, even if, even if this person is not on eligible for general assistance, he might, if for single people or married couples without children, there is the program emergency general assistance. You probably are also um, quite aware of that. Um, and you can, uh, you apply through the county the same as a family would for emergency assistance. Um, and you may be able to get money to, let's say, uh, in this case, if he's facing an eviction, he finds another place. Um, he depending on the amount of the rent and the security deposit, he would probably be able to get emergency general assistance to pay his rent. Um, it has to be an emergency. Um, and I believe in, in Hennepin County, and I'm not sure if this is statutory, it's like four times the GA amount. So, you know, that's not very much that he could get, that the person could get, um, you know, a little over $800. Um, and it helps both single adults and childless couples. Okay, now, <clears throat> oops, <laughs> I don't like this. Um, now let's say that, um, again, Juan has come in and, and talked about the fact that he can't work, um, but his doctor says, well, you know, you, you know, you've got a serious mental illness here, and you, and you have such problems such that, you know, you're not going to be able to work for a long period of time, um, not more, certainly more than 60 days and at least one year. Well, then he, um, and one of the bases for getting general assistance if you don't have, if you, if you do have a physical or mental impairment, is that you have to then apply for either SSI or RSCI. Um, SS, Social Security benefits are administered by the federal government, the Social Security Administration. So we're talking about now a different total administrative agency and, you know, a big one. Um, he, he might be eligible for either SSI or Retirement Survivors Disability Insurance. Um, now, do you, have, do you ever have people saying, well, what's the difference between SSI or RSDI or have you have you run into that at, at all? Have, are you, do you know that, the difference? Okay, be, the, so. the big difference being that SSI is your safety net program. Um, so the most you can get right now, I think is 720 or 721. Um, it is for people who have not worked in the past or have worked but have not worked recently so that they're not what we call currently insured um, by, by Social Security. Um, Social Security or Retirement Survivors Disability Insurance, sometimes called Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, sometimes people just call it Social Security, you know, I mean, it's, it's got a lot of SSDI, RSDI. That's the benefit that we would all be eligible for if tomorrow we had to um, apply um, and met the dis disability criteria because we've been working probably enough 
um, years, and we've been working up to the point where we, we apply to get the disability. It's, it's based on our work credits. And it's a program um, for when we retire, you know, um, that we all know. Um, and if, let's say, um, the parent dies, the parent dies, and there, then the survivor, the children, can get a benefit up to, I believe, age 18. And then you can also get it if you become disabled during um, the period up to the point that, that you retire. Um, so again, so, so with SSI, because it's a safety net program, um, it's going to have some different, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a program where you have income and asset guidelines. It's one of the, just let me just get these up here so we can, oops, sorry, all right. Um, SSI has strict asset and income guidelines um, for a single, it's 721 for a couple, $1,082. Uh, you, can, you can have some employment once you get on, um, but um, the, you don't want to be working too much or they're going to think that you can work and so then you're not eligible anymore. Um, but the other thing is that there are some disregards that you get um, before they start counting uh, your earnings. So it, it is a program that kind of is trying to encourage you, even though you are disabled, to get back into work. Um, the eligibility for non-citizens is probably the most restrictive of all the programs. Um, there's several categories of uh, individuals um, who can be eligible, but there's a lot of people who um, cannot be, are not eligible for SSI. Um, it depends on things like the date of arrival, if it's before 1990, August, I think, 26th, 1996 is the magic date. Um, if you came to the United States before that, you don't have to worry about any kind of restrictions, in, uh, immigrant, or um, um, restrictions because of your status. Uh, if you came after that, it's going to be, it's a totally different ball game. Um, it's going to be, they're going to look at sponsor deeming issues, you know, so there's a lot of different issues in terms of immigrants. Um, let me just see. Um, now, as far as the actual, how you become, how you establish that you're disabled, um, what happens is that people, and what's going to happen with, with, let me just, I just want to make sure that I, I don't know what the next, um, okay, so we'll go back. Essentially what you probably see are people who have applied. They apply through the Social Security Administration. They might apply online or they might actually go to the, your local Social Security office. Um, the case then, and they're saying, I can't work. These are all my doctors. These are all my health problems. Um, the, it, it's sent the case is sent over to St. Paul. They contact all your doctors, they get all your medical records, and they look at the, your, your illness. They decide whether or not it is severe enough for you, to, that, that whether, you, whether in fact you can meet, whether you can do any work in the national economy. And if, you, if they, they, you know, they have standards that they apply, they look at the medical uh, evidence, and then um, if they don't think that it meets the criteria, then they deny your benefit. You get a notice in the, in the mail, and you have 60 days in which to appeal. And um, normally what I would do is I, I normally tell people, go back to the, your Social Security. You can do it online, but I mean, my clients, I usually tell them to go back to Social Security, tell them you want to appeal. The next level up is, considered a recon is called a re request for reconsideration. Um, what, it's a paper review. Again, these are no, they never meet with you. Um, really, no, I mean the social the people at Social Security do meet, meet with you, and they write some of their comments down. But you know, all this otherwise is done by looking at your medical records. Um, if you're denied at that level, you have again 60 days, and you request a hearing. At and that's where we get involved. We do represent people in SSI cases, and we go before, they go before an administrative law judge. 
um, at the Social Security level. It's called the Office of uh, Adjudication and Disability Review. And um, it's a full-blown hearing. Normally they have a, a medical expert there from Social Security and a vocational expert. And essentially what we have to prove is that the person um, cannot work or ha is not working now, um, that their impairment is what we call severe, which is a fairly low standard. Um, whether they meet what's called the listing of impairments, which is a, a set of criteria that they'd say, if you meet this, you, are, you're, you, you definitely are disabled. We don't have to go any further. You've got this test and this test and this test. Okay, you're, you're disabled. I might, you know, that would be probably the first thing that, you know, we'd argue is that they meet the listing. But they may not meet the listing. Then, they're going, then the next queries are, can they, given their impairments, can they return to their former work? Um, and if not, can they do any other job in the national economy? And so, and what is interesting and what I have to usually explain to people <coughs> is that doing any job in the national economy means doing a simple, unskilled, one, two, maybe three step job. So if, if they can find that you can do that, you're probably not going to be considered disabled. Um, and I can tell you that they mental... They tell you where to find those jobs. No, no, <laughs> they don't really care. In fact, they don't have to. Um, but on the other hand, you know, and I will tell you that the mental impairment cases are the hardest, which is why we probably do more mental impairment cases than almost anything else. I mean, the physical cases, physical cases are also difficult depending on the situation, um, but um, the mental impairment cases are re very difficult. Our office does not do RSDI cases, and I think I did say that before, I just want to reiterate. Um, we do do SSI cases. Um, and probably, I mean, most, in most cases, we do not do what's called concurrent, which would be RSDI and SSI. Sometimes people have worked, they will get an RSDI benefit, but it's so low that it's lower than the SSI benefit, so you get SSI to supplement up to the $721 plus another $20. Um, there are, after the, if you lose at the hearing level, there are some more levels of appeal. Um, if we are representing the person, we may or may not go further. There's an appeal counsel, and then you go into federal court. We certainly have gone into federal court with our clients. Now, if you win, then you get 721. If you have um, high housing costs, so let's say, because a lot of people then are living in public housing, but you, let's say you have high housing costs, you may be eligible for another supplement. It's state money, it's called Minnesota Supplemental Assistance, and it's about $81 is what you'd be entitled to. However, there are some other little, if you have a special diet, you might be eligible for some additional benefits. You know, um, not, It's a very under, underutilized program, I, I can say. So, all right, let's see. Um, so. The other thing that we do, um, because most private attorneys do not do them, is termination of social, social security benefits. So we do actually do term, termination of both SSI and RSDI. What happens is a person gets on. If they're young, um, social security is going to be looking at their case in probably um, three or six years. And, and what they do is a total review. They want all of medical records again. And, if they think that there has been medical improvement, such that the person can return to work, then they will terminate them. They will send a notice of termination. In those cases, you get two bites of the apple in terms of hearings. You get, again, always 60-day appeal periods. Um, you can go to the, a, um, the first hearing is in St. Paul in front of an administrative person. Um, and then the next hearing, again, after, if you're denied there, again, a 60-day appeal period and the hearing at the Office of Adjudica Adjudication and Review. Important, very important here, and this is why, again, with these appeal cases, if they're, they call and they say, I'm going to be terminated, just got this notice, if they appeal within 10 days of receiving the notice, they can request benefits pending appeal. For these people, it is extremely important because this is probably all the income they're living off of. And if they lose that, if they miss that peri uh, appeal period, it's difficult. If we have in some situations, if there was some sort of good cause, we've been able to get them back on uh, and go back and have them reopen and start the benefits again. 
or if they miss it at the, fir at the initial level, then they're denied it the, and, and they go to request reconsideration. If they, do, if they appeal that one within 10 days, then they could get benefits pending appeal going forward. But that's a really important one. Again, it's always, you know, which is why I, again, advise people to appeal right away. As soon as you get off the phone, find a way to appeal because, you know, you can always, here's the thing I always tell people, you can always withdraw your appeal. But, you know, if you, if you miss your appeal deadline, you know, you're, you have to reapply. You're not, you know, you're, that appeal is gone. You, you can, you know, and the thing, the other thing about SSI, RSDI, you know, let's say you lose at the hearing. I mean, you could go back and you decide not to appeal. You can go back and appeal or uh, reapply the next day. I mean, you know, and you, if you have new and, new and additional evidence, medical evidence, go back and, and reapply. Um, almost done here. Okay, and the, the other thing that, um, um, now here in this case, Pedro um, is diagnosed with ADHD and depression. He's having great difficulty in school. He has an individual education plan and he's also on some sort of medication, but still having significant problems. He, in fact, might be eligible for SSI as a child. It's a different standard, and, um, on, and um, we do take childhood disability cases. Um, you have to prove that the child is markedly impaired, which is a really high standard, in um, one of about five areas, in two of five areas of function, um, intellectual functioning, uh, personal behavioral functioning, social functioning, motor functioning, things like that. Um, it, and, and we take those to hearing, and um, so the child may be eligible for SSI, and if the, if the parents are working, he'll get probably a reduced amount, but if the parents, let's say, are on MFIP, then um, the child would probably, if they're found eligible, be eligible for the full benefit amount. Um, and I think that's all, yes, that's it. Questions? Um, what, what program do you use? Um, over at your position. Um, is there one that pops up more than others, or is it kind of a, a mixed you know, bag of all? It's a very mixed bag. I think that what happens is that, you know, um, different attorneys probably have a little more specialty in certain areas. Um, Ellen Smart um, is teaching a class at the U uh, in a clinical for unemployment comps, so we shoot a lot of her cases okay. during the school year, but then we all do UC otherwise, you know. Um, I certainly have done lots of childhood S uh, SSI cases, um, done a lot of health care, and work a lot with um, MFIP sanctions. So, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, every, I think, um, you know, it's, it's because, because it really is whatever comes in the door mm -hmm. to some degree, um, you know, that what's going to kind of show you where, where you're going to go. Um, but, um, you know, you got to try to be able to do almost anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what is considered suitable employment, or what do these uh, benefit programs consider to be suitable employment for people that um, want to get on them? Um, well, you mean like if MFIP, in MFIP, if they're saying that you have to get a job? Yes, if you have to get a job and there's been a job offer and they... And you have to take the job offer. Oh, okay. So there's suitable not employment much, means any job offer. Yeah, um, there really isn't a suitable employment standard in in MFIP. There is in um, unemployment comp, and it's a long definition, and um, I really am not up to speed on the, the total definition. Um, you know, it's got several parts to it for unemployment comp, but for MFIP, they just want you to get a job. But if and, you're making, like, a low enough amount that you, you would still get more from MFIP, you can still do both, right? Absolutely. The other thing is that sometimes if the job is so low pay, let's say it's a self-employment job, where you really, when you, when you, because, you know, they'll figure out what's your hourly amount. And if it's so low, they may not, um, because it's self-employment, you'd have to get some sort of more um, approval of that, and they may not approve that and consider that to be employment. Um, but most low-pay jobs are 
what they want you to get into initially. They're gonna, and you're right. Um, if um, let's see, there's a. I, I actually brought this along. This is from um, one of their the DHS bulletins. It's called Work Will Always Pay, and um, somehow I just I don't know. But um, let's see. If you're working um, thirty hours a week at $7.25 an hour, you'll still get $207 of MFIP and $569 of food. Um, if you are, if you make $1,297, your cash benefit stops, your, your clock stops, um, but you're still entitled to um, food of $569. If you're making 2,200 and, now again, this is for a household of four, $2,295, that's when you basically get nothing. No food, no, no infant. But the, and so the important one is like when the clock stops because once you're making over the 1,297, any months that you're getting food, you're not, it's still, it's not counted towards your MFIP months because you're not getting MFIP anymore. You've uh, timed out of that or cashed out. So, and it changed a little bit, but I will tell you that the, the grant amounts for MFIP have not changed since 1989. A family of two were getting $437 in 89 and still get $439. Yes? This is kind of a broad question, but um, with the minimum wage possibly changing, that would probably cause all these programs to have a overall with the income requirements. Oh, that's mine. I'm sorry. I thought I had silenced my phone. I mean, it's okay. Um, I'm sorry. So, um, do you think or have you heard that if there was an, in, um, uh, if there was an income change as far as if they change the minimum wage, would there be an overhaul to all of these programs' income requirements? I would think so, but I can't say that I've heard that. Okay. I think what ha what would happen is that the person would be um, would become ineligible quicker, okay. more quickly, um, based on their income. Yeah, I think you know. I mean, in some ways, it's like no, I I haven't. Seen that. Heard that? I mean, the problem always at the you know what happens is you're at the legislature, and you want the benefit amount increased, and it's got a fiscal note, and it's probably like, you know, it's very difficult to get anything, you know. Uh, we several a couple years ago we got some little work benefit that you would get like fifty dollars a month for several months because after you you worked your way off of MFIP. But that was about it. I mean, essentially, and that was a hard fight. Now, you know, the next, you know, if we get the, the, the minimum wage raised this year, it's possible in, you know, and depending on our, in, our economy, that we may be able to push more. But it, it is extremely difficult to try to get benefit levels increased. I mean, every year we certainly have tried, although I have to say that there have been years where, it didn't even make sense to even try just because we didn't have any money and we were in deficit, you know. Um, so I don't, I, I'm not hearing anything yet. I mean, I, I'm sure that, you know, we'll be talking about it next year. Okay. Um, but I, I'm not, don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kath, uh, Kathleen, we're, I th we're at the end. The only thing that I would add is that remember for some Social Security disability claims where the claimant is, attempting to either get on Social Security or is, is attempting to retain their benefits. There are private lawyers that handle Absolutely. some of that work and they are found under our alternative 211 referral button on our website. Absolutely. So. Um, and then I did bring also another copy of the garnishment and your rights, but the, I know the question was from last time, but um, I brought a little Fire about garnishment and rights because there was a good question um, last time, and this hopefully can. You know, we have this, um, you know, the lawhelp.org 
at lawhelpmn.org. Um, if you go on there, they have really good fact sheets. Um, hopefully they're understandable, although I found this one to be rather lengthy myself, and I didn't write it though. But, um, but basically, I would really, you know, encourage you to, if there's some, or, or referring people to that. Of course, you know, part of the, you know, I mean, it's try, we try to write them um, so that um, the general public can understand them. And that one is on there. And then I, I'll give um, Ellie this, but there was something else I agreed to do, too. I can't remember what that was. I'm not remembering. Oh, but... There was something. What was the other one that I was going to look up? Oh, if there are employment programs um, through the county. I'm going to write that down right now. So there's some. All right, great. Well, um, I think we're out of time. <laughs> and so, um, Kathleen, thank you so very, very much sure. for a wonderful, great presentation. My pleasure. We really appreciate it.